Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. My name is Gus Docker, and I'm here with Annie Jacobson. Annie is an investigative journalist and the finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the author of, I think, six books on history. Is that right, Annie? This is the seventh. Yes, it is. This is the seventh. What we're talking about today is your latest book, which is called Nuclear War, A Scenario. So what is that scenario? What do you do in this book? Just introduce it to us. Yes, you know, I'm going to set it up by talking for a brief second about those first six books, because that's what led me to new nuclear war. And when I say that, I just mean this in some every, you know, I write about war and weapons, national security and secrets. And every one of those books on the CIA, on the Pentagon, on specific military bases, on CIA paramilitary programs, hundreds of people in each book, all of those books, all fundamentally come down to one thing, to prevent or deter nuclear war. You know, how many octogenarians who dedicated their lives to national security, be it, you know, as the director of science and technology at the CIA or a general at the Pentagon have said to me, Annie, my life was about preventing World War III and we did it. These are the cold warriors speaking, right? And so here we find ourselves, the younger generation, at this time and place, this moment in history. And it, and I wonder, what if deterrence fails? What if this idea of prevention doesn't hold? What if someone launches a nuclear weapon? And that became the premise of this book, Nuclear War, A Scenario. I interviewed scores of national security folks who've dedicated their lives to this issue, you know, very close to the president, presidential advisor, STRATCOM commander, CIA director, White House chief of staff, to find out from them the ticking clock scenario of how this would unfold. And, you know, I'm literally shocked and I wrote the book. <laughs> Would you question this concept of deterrence? What led you to to question that concept? Inside baseball, national security people like myself and probably yourself love to kind of go inside to YouTube videos of STRATCOM commander testifying for Congress, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly during the pandemic, with a little extra time on my hands and with a president in office that many individuals here questioned the fundamental concept of sole authority, right? So this this idea came back to the fore, into the discussion. And I noticed a lot of STRATCOM commanders and deputy commanders and whatnot talking about deterrence. And the sort of more inside baseball I got, meaning I would look at like more private, not classified, but private events among military people, I noticed, and I quote them in the book, of course, these, you know, de for example, the deputy director of Stratcom saying, you know, deterrence holds kind of like this with this authoritative voice. But if it doesn't, everything unravels. And that word unravels began to haunt me. What does that unraveling look like? And the number one most shocking original out of the gate, oh my God, is just how fast it all unravels. And that's why the ticking clock scenario concept, I think, is so terrifying and hopefully so effective because the point of this book is not to unnecessarily terrify people. It's to realistically inform people of just what a razor's edge we all stand on, because suddenly this idea of certain authoritarian leaders or dictators are talking about the possibility of nuclear use. I think it's worth sketching what the terms means in, in kind of traditional terms. How, how have we thought about the terms? What does it mean? And, and yeah, before we, we talk about why we should question the concept. Absolutely. And I'm with you on that, because, you know, one of the things is like, the, the the nomenclature, the kind of esoteric language around nuclear weapons, I find is set up to intimidate people. It's set up to kind of divide people between, you know, 
us and them, the kind of, and, and I had not previously been an us. I was the, you know, it's like, and I, I find that dangerous. And so you can really break things down easily. And by the way, the sources that I work with are usually the smartest people in the room. And I, what I have found over the course of my reporting career is actually the smartest people in the room, if you ask them, will explain things very simply because they can. It's like Einstein said, you know, if you really know what you're talking about, you should be able to explain it to a child, right? We're all children here when it comes to nuclear weapons. And we have to be adults, right? So deterrence, to deter, basic word you learn, we all learned in high school, like to prevent, right? But here's another thing I'm, I'll, I'll say to our listeners here is that many people have heard of the concept of mad right? Mutual assured destruction. And many people go, oh, yes, I'm familiar with that concept. That's why there is no nuclear war. Mutual assured destruction, which folds right in there with the concept of deterrence, meaning, you know, one side, let's just use the US and Russia, one side has a stockpile of nuclear weapons pointed at the other guy. And the other guy, in this case, Russia, has a stockpile of nuclear weapons pointed at the other. And each side would be absolutely mad to launch a nuclear weapon because of mutual assured destruction. It would guarantee that we would all die. But of course, you and I both know that after you come up with the concept of mad, then other concepts follow. First strike, you know, and then it becomes game theory on its head about how to outfox mutual assured destruction. True. What you do in the book is walk through a timeline of events and maybe maybe tell us about what is the scenario you're envisioning here? Uh, who is launching a, a nuclear attack against who? One of the most interesting and disturbing ideas I came across when I was deciding what makes the most sense to, to have the scenario happen, how, once I began to learn how it unfolds in literally seconds and minutes and then hours, like, was, well, what is the plausible, you know, ignition? Because many authors and certainly fiction authors, because remember, this is a nonfiction book, it's kind of like been called dystopian nonfiction because how it ends is with nuclear winter. So many people have written hypotheticals about how it could happen, right? If, you know, Russia does this or China does this, etc. But I was less interested in the, that, in the political gaming out of it, of the how. I was more interested in if. If this happens, if deterrence unravels, boom. And that's why it begins in the first fraction of a second, which is when United States incredible satellite technology can first see the nuclear launch, okay? So the way I came to the idea, you asked how to start it, who starts it, was in a discussion I had with Richard Garwin. And if you're not familiar with Richard Garwin, Richard is now 93, not maybe he's 94, and he drew the plans for the world's first thermonuclear weapon. Everyone's familiar with Edward Teller and they call him the father of the hydrogen bomb, the thermonuclear bomb. When in fact, Richard Garwin, when he was 23 years old, drew the plans. And this is actually not even written in some of the most famous books about the hydrogen bomb because it wasn't declassified or known until about 10 years ago, right? But Richard Garwin unequivocally drew those plans. And he, in a discussion that we had about this, he raised the concern with me of kind of the madman theory, the idea that there are people, and Garwin specifically mentioned Napoleon, who follow this logic of après moi le déluge, which is like after me the flood, you know, if I die, may everyone die. And so that hypothetical, which I figured out actually terrifies everyone, or rather I should say many in Washington, is the premise. It's what is called a rogue launch. In nuclear nomenclature, it's called a bolt out of the blue attack, which is actually pretty easy for we laymen to understand because it is literally a bolt out of the blue. It's like all of a sudden there's a nuclear weapon coming our way. 
That is how it begins. And the first interesting thing to me to learn was we don't learn about the nuclear weapon coming our way when it, you know, destroys a city. We learn, we, the Defense Department, learn about it in the first fraction of a second after launch because of our satellite technology. I was suddenly like, oh my God, you have a narrative, right? The mad ruler, the you know, who launched. And then you have the technology. And that's what I think I do in nuclear war scenario is weave these concepts together in this horrifyingly tight knot because that is what it is. It's just a big giant conundrum of what happens next. You mentioned that the U.S., will know about this strike within seconds. Maybe take us through what happens within the first, say, 10 seconds or a minute, because what's really fascinating, what we, what really struck me about this book is how quickly all of this happens. And also perhaps tell us about how we know when these different steps happen. Yes, yes. So, you know, satellite technology, we think of like, We're doing this interview right now, thanks to Wi-Fi, thanks to satellite technology. Not that long ago, as in 1957, there was only one satellite, and that was Sputnik. The Russians beat us into space. And now, all these years later, there's something like 9,000 or more satellites circling the Earth. And yes, many of them do great things like what we're doing right now in communication and GPS and television, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But The Defense Department satellites do a very specific set of satellites, which are called SIBRs, right? And that's the space-based infrared system of satellites. And what the SIBR satellites do is they are parked, essentially, in geosync, 22,000 miles up, one-tenth of the way to the moon, parked there, this massive school bus sized satellite with sensors literally the size of like a, a car and they are looking down at the hot spots they are looking down at the launch pads of the nuclear armed nations so that they know in the first fraction of a second not even one second when that missile launches and you know of course the obvious question is wait how do they know well you know the as explained to me by various missile experts, including Ted Postal, who was is an amazing resource for all of this, that the satellite sensors can measure the plume on the hot rocket exhaust. So you can like visualize this. Suddenly it becomes a reality. Like you see this launch, you know, ICBM, this giant, you know, 60 foot tall missile. It's in North Korea. It's on a road mobile launcher, which itself is astonishing. The thing has, you know, 22 axles. We don't have road mobile launchers in America, by the way, but they do in Russia and North Korea. And the reason we don't have them is your average American doesn't want an ICBM driving by, driving through their town, right? But that that's okay in North Korea. And so they have these road mobile launchers, this thing in the in the scenario is taken out into a dirt field, as we have seen happen in testing, and it's launched. And the Sibbers Defense Department satellite sees it in less than a second. And there begins this absolute, you know, massive, like, five-alarm fire alert, literally. Before we go into that, actually... I would want to know what's the probability of a, of a false positive there. If, the, if the, we have the satellite looking at a launch platform for a nuclear weapon in, say, North Korea, a, a mobile launch platform, how do we know that, that we don't get a, a, a false positive such that we think there's a launch when there isn't a launch? Yes. Okay, so it's a great question. Well, first of all, most of the nuclear armed nations, like, for example, Russia, announce their ICBM launches to other countries. And this is true even during the Ukraine war, because no one wants to start a nuclear war by accident, right? So people let others know. Um, and, you know, countries have been known to suspend launches during times of great tension for exactly that reason you're talking about. The exception to the rule is North Korea. If you talk to the North Korean missile experts, they will tell you North Korea does not announce its launches. They just want to be powerful. They want to flex, as we could say. So how do we know it's not a mistake? Well, they launch 
mi- missiles over the sea. And so the, from the, the computer systems and cybers, because remember, you have this satellite system in space, but it communicates with ground systems. That is why it is called a system of systems. And so the data that gets sent down to the earth, those, that machine learning is set and put and understands. I'm speaking in layman's terms here that the trajectory of this launch is going to send it over the sea or the trajectory of this launch is sending it into space. And the different, that is where those first few seconds are so critical. And I literally take you through the first seconds in the book through these different locations of what happens at the aerospace data facility in Colorado, what happens at Fort Belvoir in, in Washington, what happens at the Pentagon, because these different alerts bring everyone who is in the nuclear command and control system into focus on this event to categorize the nature of this launch. And that is where the mechanisms of this system are just so remarkable because you realize how many people are on it, right? But also at the same time, there's absolutely no action to take except for counterattack if it's an actual launch. I mean, we'll, we can get into the interceptor program, which is its, its whole other shocking discussion. But yes, those are the first seconds of launch and they are, they are very methodical. How do we distinguish between a, an actual launch and, 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 a, and a, something that looks to the, to the satellites and the machine learning system uh, like a launch? Well, there are, th- there are thousands of them all the time. The Defense Department is constantly there. If you, you know, again, the nerd sort of go deep into the, the Defense Department videos, they actually for, released some footage from Chi- the command center in beneath Cheyenne Mountain. And it's remarkable because it's actual video footage. This was done during COVID, and I'd never seen this before. And you can see this, you know, it looks like something out of the movies with a giant, like kind of IMAX type screen with maps of the world, and you can see launches going off, right? So this is, satellites are being launched, short range ballistic missiles are launched. We have our eye on all the missiles in Ukraine, and we can see what is, we, the Defense Department can see all of this. The question is, or rather the specifics are that the SIPR satellites are focused on those launch pads that will, that, that might, or in the case of North Korea, road mobile launcher that might launch an ICBM. It's going to be very different from what a launch looks like, you know, in Donbass. Do you think there's any probability that something that's not a launch would be picked up as a launch? Do, do, like a cloud floating over the platform, or I don't know what's realistic here, whatever it might be. This this exactly happened there. I, in the book, I do take you, I, I stop the action sometimes to give you these small history lessons, right? Because there, you know, and, and one of the readers said to me, I thought I would like get a rest from the horror by reading these history lessons, and the history lessons themselves are terrifying. Because to, for exactly that reason, so once... In the early to mid 90s, Yeltsin was president. There was a launch, like sort of a, it was a science project between Norway and the United States to look at, to gather some data from the atmosphere, right? They were looking at sort of climatology, climate issues, I believe. And this launch was mistaken by an early warning system in Russia for an ICBM launch. And this is the only known time that the Russian equivalent of the football, right? So many listeners are familiar with the fact that the president walks around with this brief, or rather his military aide walks around with a briefcase that has the nuclear launch codes in it. And Russia, because of what we call parity, has the same, you know, essentially the same systems more or less. And that is the only time in history that the Shegat, their football is called, was opened, which is just like the razor's edge of Armageddon. And then it was determined that this was actually, as you would say, a reporting error, and the Shagat was closed. Yeah, you 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 talk about at least six close calls uh, where we could have had nuclear attacks, a nuclear war in the book. I think we should talk about those. Um, but first, let's go let's go back to these the, these first critical seconds. What happens after a launch is detected? Who knows about it first? And how is that signal transmitted through the through the entire kind of military and governance uh, apparatus? It's amazing how fast 
the next big action happens. All that information has to get to these three primary command centers, which are all underground, okay? These are the nuclear command and control bunkers. And so within seconds, the information from the from the from Sibbers goes to the aerospace data facility. The National Reconnaissance Office works with the NSA, works with the Missile Defense Agency. There's a new number of agencies that are all processing this information. The Defense Department is built on what we call redundancy, but within seconds, all the information lands at there's a bunker beneath the Pentagon, there's a bunker inside Cheyenne Mountain, and there's a bunker beneath. Offit Air Force Base in Nebraska, which is STRATCOM, that's U.S. Strategic Command. So the simplest way to think about this, and by the way, this is how people on the inside explained it to me, Cheyenne Mountain is the brain, okay? It's the brain that pulls it all together. The Pentagon is the beating heart. The bunker under the Pentagon was created as a war room right after World War II. And then STRATCOM, Offit Air Force Base, the bunker beneath there, is the muscle. So they each have their individual roles, but those three command centers now, within seconds after launch, are on it. And why are they on it? Because the next big action that has to happen, and you're like, they have to notify the president, right? So, oh my God, it just goes boom, that's it. And yes, there now will be a few minutes of verification. And... But all of these individuals, specifically, no RAD commander is figuring is going to probably be the one to brief the president with SecDef, who is most likely in the Pentagon, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, most likely in the Pentagon, with STRATCOM commander kind of in the wings. He would, if there was action to take, he would take over. And they must get ready to brief the president. Now, this has happened maybe three or four times, and I write them in the book. I've interviewed Secretary of Defense, former Bill Perry, for example, who was in one of these situations, woken up in the middle of the night where he thought he was going to have to be brief the president and didn't, right? So the de-escalation process is now if it's going to happen. Like, But there are only minutes and the confirmation. So if president gets told probably around five or six minutes after launch. That's how long it takes to determine the reason to reasonably determine the trajectory of the ICBM, right? Like, is it going to over the sea? Is it headed toward Hawaii? Is it going to Moscow? Or is it coming to the continental United States? And as the powers that be get ready to brief the president, then the entire system is also preparing for what must be a secondary confirmation, and that comes from the ground radar systems that are positioned around the world and have been in play since before satellite technology gave that initial, you know, bell ringer of in the first fraction of a second. So in those five minutes... How much leeway is there to make a, a decision based on your your personal sense of what's going on, as opposed to just acting uh, in accordance with the law? I imagine that the the people you're you're talking about now in the U.S. government are under kind of strict uh, have very strict legal responsibilities to act in a certain way. But we know that that uh, previously in history in the USSR, for example. We've had uh, close calls where only for where, where the personal uh, actions of, of uh, uh, key people in, in the chain prevented a nuclear uh, launch. Um, so how much leeway is there in the system and how much uh, are, they, are, are the people involved acting under strict uh, legal requirements? I was having a discussion yesterday with a Los Alamos scientist who's also the classified historian there. And... He said to me, I was having this exact question. We were talking about whether or not people or this, what he called sort of like misconception that a military person would disobey protocol. And he said to me, you have a better chance at winning Powerball than banking on someone in the nuclear command and control defying orders. That's not how it works. With that said, it's a great question. And that is something that would come up, I imagine, right before those keys turn for a U.S. counterstrike, 
right? But now would not be the time to debate. Now would be the time for the entire nuclear command control and communication system to be working, flexing, to try and determine what the hell is going on. And then immediately followed by what actions to take. And so I think now's a great time to mention a really important fact here, right? Which is presidential sole authority in the United States, right? So I did a Google, if you do a Google search and you type in, can the US president launch a nuclear war? Interestingly, you get an answer that says, it says, well, not really. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And it's like, it's fascinating to me that that is just fundamentally not true. Okay. So Congress did, a, and, and, I, and I cite this stuff in the book. Of course, my book has the scenario and then there's a hundred pages of notes in the back. But Congress handled this exact question. There's, they have a congressional research service that will like look into a subject and put out an open source document for all to read. And this question came up during the Trump North Korea fire and fury debates during his administration. And so Congress put out this report that said, yes, the president has sole launch authority. He does not need to ask anyone, not the secretary of defense, not the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, not Congress, period, full stop. And so you can't really say yes, sort of no. The answer is yes. That is the answer right? And if you do watch STRATCOM commanders talk about this, there is a lot of obfuscating going on, right? Really what it comes down to is one would hope one had a sane president who wouldn't make an unwise decision. But as I show you in nuclear war scenario, how do you even define what unwise decision is, right? Because I take the reader through the specifics of what a strike, a nuclear strike against Washington, D.C. would look like. How many people would be killed? How many people would be burned alive? And of course, this is why we have in place the concept of deterrence, full circle to our initial, right? Because don't do that or else we will do that to you, right? And this is the vicious circle. From the moment the president is briefed, until he has to make a decision about whether to launch a counter-strike. How long does he have? Very simple answer. Six minutes. We know this how. How do we know that it's six minutes exactly? Some will say it's five. Some will say it's seven. The reason I use six minutes is because it's what President Ronald Reagan wrote in his memoirs, right? So it's a nice number that indicates this is what he was told, and that's more or less what everyone is told. And I also think it's important to just note, anyone who starts being super corrective on numbers, please roll your eyes, because that is, in my estimation, part of the system to make people feel like you shouldn't really worry yourself about this. You're not smart enough, knowledgeable enough, informed enough. You don't know what you're... It's just hogwash, you know? As Hans Christensen will tell you, who leads the nuclear notebook with his team and and gathers all these numbers, like how many weapons are on ready for launch, how, you know, these numbers are the best we can come up with, or rather not we, he and his team, and then they are put out and borrowed, and but they change, right? And so it is six minutes as a concept, but, you know, in what if the, for like, one of the interesting things I did was interview a lot of Secret Service agents, including a former head of the Secret Service, about how the president is moved, right? And this stuff is just at the razor's edge of can't be known, but should be known. But what I was told what should be known and can be known, right? So if the president has six minutes to decide and the Secret Service, the head of the president's detail decides to move him to a co underground command bunker called Raven Rock, the alternative National Military Command Center, you know, 70 miles outside D.C., well, then you have a pause in that six-minute window when the president needs to decide. Even though the football is with him and technically the clock is ticking, that window may be extended because Secret Service says, no, we're moving him. We're not keeping him in the underground bunker beneath the White House. Imagine a scenario where, where a president has to make the decision about whether to, to launch uh, nuclear weapons against an adversary. Of course, he would be influenced by 
whether he would personally die in a, in the situation in which he he doesn't respond. Uh, but how 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 is that handled? Um, wh- how is the decision made about whether to move him and if, were he to stay in D.C. Uh, in the White House, for example, would he die in that scenario? And as a historian, I love this question, and I loved sort of picking through these details and learn and continuing to learn them as I go. From what I understand, President Reagan and President Carter both t- were have they said, I'm going to stay with the ship, paraphrasing, right? So we know both of those presidents were going to wait it out in the White House and let others disperse because there is a whole very significant concept, you know, during a nuclear strike, which is called continuity of government, which is where you have to keep the government running. So if the president isn't going to go, someone has to in his place. And of course, I get into that in the book, but this is a great question. And which I think a parallel question, which was interesting to me, I interviewed former Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta for the book. And he was such an extremely valuable source for me, so generous with his time. He was also the director of the CIA and a former White House chief of staff. So he had this incredible perspective that he shared with me about how different, really high-ranking presidential advisors have completely different sets of information based on what their primary focus is. So he was saying as CIA director, he knew almost none of the nuclear command and control issues, certainly not to the degree he did when he was Secretary of Defense, and he suddenly found himself visiting these places, right? And realizing, oh my God, my job is extraordinary. And then he also shared with me that most presidents, he was not the only Secretary of Defense to share this with me, most presidents and I'm paraphrasing, don't want to know. Don't think they need to know. They have other things to worry about besides a nuclear war, which everyone wants to believe, quote unquote, will never happen. And so therein lies a huge problem because, you know, presidents may, they are they are briefed before they take office about all of this, but they may or may not be paying attention. And that is, those are the words of, presidential advisors, not me. That is me relaying what was what I was told. That presidents aren't paying attention to this critical information. I mean, think of all the things you have to hear about and think about all the things that are perhaps more pressing. And we've had decades of living with the first atomic bomb and now the thermonuclear bomb. And, and everyone wants to live under this idea that nuclear war will never happen. But as I posit in the book, and as certainly Richard Garwin, who arguably knows more about nuclear weapons than anyone on the planet, shared with me that when all this began, there were two nuclear armed. Well, first there was one, America. Then there were two, you know, America and Russia. And now there are nine. And it is impossible not to refer to nuclear armed North Korea as anything but a rogue nation based on their behavior. They do not, you know, I want to say play nice. They 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 do not adhere to the air quotes norms that the other nuclear armed nations allegedly play by. And that makes them very dangerous. And it is the rogue launch scenario I chose for the book because I wanted to show you how you can have these two superpowers, America and Russia, which, by the way, each have one approximately 1,700 weapons on ready for launch status, you know, essentially metaphorically aimed at one another. And I wanted to show you the errors that will likely happen based on the judgments of presidential advisors were a rogue launch to happen and the president have to, the U.S. president have to launch a counterattack. And those those variables are what should terrify us all and have many more people in conversation about what to do about it. As you interview all of these people, uh, all of these insiders, what were some of the most um, surprising lessons for you that that you think should be uh, publicly known? Two come to mind immediately because they are so incredibly dangerous. They shocked me when I learned them and they continue to shock me. The first is this. Okay. So 
America has, as we've spoken about, the Sibir satellite system that can see a launch. Russia, you know, wanting to have everything on parity, on par with the United States, has its own set of space-based satellite systems that, that look at ICBM launches. But as all the experts will tell you, the Russian systems are deeply flawed, right? And when I say all the experts, I didn't find a single person who would tell me otherwise. Some people said, well, they're not that flawed. Others, you know, talked about the extreme flaws. But the Russian satellite system, which is called Tundra, it doesn't have, this is kind of in layman's terms as it was explained to me, right? It doesn't have what's called look down capability. So Sibbers looks exactly down on the rocket and that's why it can measure. It's out, it's computer systems, it's sensors can measure. And Tundra doesn't have this capacity and so it has to look sideways, which makes a lot of problems, as you said, with, for example, clouds or sunlight. And th the idea that experts that study this field meticulously believe is that Russia could mistake a launch, right? So let's say there was a rogue launch at the United States of one weapon, and the president decided to strike back with 80 nuclear weapons, 82, right? As is suggested in that situation. Russia could mistake those missile launches for hundreds of weapons. And then it looks like they're coming at Russia, okay? Even more perilous is the second part of the equation that you asked me about, which is what I call the hole over the, over the pole, right? Which is that U.S. Minutemen ICBMs have to fly over Russia to get to North Korea. Imagine in a moment of nuclear crisis saying to Russia, well, trust us, they're just going over you. They're not coming at you, okay? Even worse, and remember, we're talking about minutes now, right? Because the launch has to happen before the strike hits the United States. That is policy. It's called launch on warning. It's not launch after we absorb a nuclear attack. It's called launch on warning. So you're talking about less than 30 minutes into the scenario, the U.S. president launches nuclear weapons, but has to tell Russia, by the way, they're not coming for you. They're just going over you. Making matters worse, How? what's the guarantee you can get Russia on the phone? And, and to anyone who says that's ridiculous, of course you could. I'm going to quote former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, during the Ukraine war when it was errantly, you know, mistakenly reported that a Russian missile had hit a NATO country, Poland. Okay, it was a mistake. It, that wasn't what happened, but that's how it was reported all over the press, you know, in real time, essentially. General Milley could not get his Russian counterpart on the phone for more than 24 hours. That is a quote from the general. Do we know why that happened? Why that enormous delay in, in such, a, such an important situation? Ask General Milley, right? But it tells you everything. There was a war going on and he couldn't get his Russian counterpart. So how does one want to just live in fantasy land thinking in the moment of crisis, 26 minutes after the Sibir satellite system notifies of a rogue launch, one American president can get another president on the phone instantly. Different time zones. Hostilities at a high. When in the timeline would the American public know about what's going on? Perhaps I should have listed that as one of the biggest shockers, right? So, and again, once you realize, oh my God, this is all happening in seconds and minutes, not days and weeks. But, you know, we think about FEMA here in the United States, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And, you know, it's FEMA who gets involved when we have earthquakes or, you know, floods or Katrina, right? FEMA you know, comes out with the sandbags and the, you know, meals ready to eat, allegedly. It's FEMA who is in charge of preparing for a nuclear war. I interviewed Craig Fugate, who was the director of FEMA under Obama. I mean, he handled, you know, dozens of hurricanes with, you know, incredible skill. What he told me shocked me, which is, 
There is nothing to do in a bolt out of a blue attack. There is no population protection planning because everyone will be dead. This is a quote from him. It's hyperbole, but it's not hyperbole, right? I said to him, what is your advice to the American public? And he said, you know, don't forget your morals. Hope that you stalked Pedialyte. So to answer your question, when does the American public know? Well, they're going to find out when, in this scenario, Washington, D.C. has just been annihilated. They're going to find out when all the comms go down. And this is around half an hour in uh, after launch. Yes. And here, okay, so let's go through the ICBM just really simply, okay? Because when it got explained to me this way, it was like, oh my goodness, it, now this makes sense, okay? Because people also think about like, technology is just moving so fast, but the ICBM is basically what it was in 1960, okay? The late 50s. And my interest in ICBM comes from an earlier book I wrote called The Pentagon's Brain, which why the United States has its agency DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And the first chief scientist was a guy called Herb Bjork. As a journalist, you can find out a lot in someone's papers that they leave to a private library. Because inside those papers, they often leave a lot of I don't want to say classified documents, but they leave a lot of documents that might otherwise not be so easy for someone to find. And that was certainly the case with me going to the Giselle Library down in San Diego to look at Herb Bjork's papers where he left everything after he died. And in those papers, I found the first known analysis of how, precisely how long it takes for an ICBM to get from a launch pad in Russia to the United States. Herb York hired the Jason scientists, kind of the brilliant American scientists who were in charge of solving these hard problems, and they measured it down to seconds. And this is what they came up with, 1,600 seconds from launch to annihilation, okay? Three phases, really simple. Boost phase, mid-course phase, terminal phase. Boost phase is five minutes, Okay, we spoke about the hot rocket exhaust on the ICBM. The satellite systems can only see the ICBM in the five minutes that it's essentially burning out the back, okay, and getting rid of its boosters. After five minutes, it enters mid course phase, and now it will fly between 500 and 700 miles above the Earth at, you know, 15,000 miles an hour to the other side of the world, at which point. For the last 100 seconds, it will be in what's called terminal phase, which is pretty obvious what it is. It re-enters the atmosphere, the warhead arms and detonates, and that is the end. So 26 minutes and 40 seconds. Now, North Korea geographically is a little different. I had Ted Postal, the missile expert, do the math. It's about 33 minutes, right? So that's approximately the amount of time it takes. And that is absolutely known in nuclear command and control. And so from the first fraction of a second, 30 minutes later, it's the first target. And we haven't even begun to talk about what submarines do, which almost no one out there in the general public, including me formerly before writing this book, knew, which is that a submarine can sneak up on the coast and launch a nuclear weapon in minutes. And this is just like a shocking truth that no one wants to talk about. So this is all happening in, in, in minutes to maybe 30 minutes. At least it's happening in under an hour. This is all something that, that struck me about the book was how you, you, you segment the, the progression of this nuclear attack timeline into, into segments of 24 minutes, three of those, and then into 24 months. So what we're talking about here is something that happens extremely suddenly, but then transforms the world and the effects are felt for <laughs> much longer than 24 months. But the effect, it, it, it's sudden and then there's a long aftermath. Let's actually take the, the point about submarines because that's, that's pretty interesting. How do submarines change the kind of strategic aspects of defending against uh, nuclear weapons? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to take you to the president's briefing to, to get to this submarine issue, right? Because again, president, maybe not even, I mean, 
Certainly one would hope the president knows what the nuclear triad is, but do most people reading this book before? No. Nuclear triad. Triad means three, right? When the president is told you need to launch nuclear weapons in a counterattack, this weapon is coming at us. It's going to be here in less than 30 minutes. This isn't policy. Launch on warning. The football gets opened. That is the suitcase, that, right? The satchel that is constantly with the president, also with the vice president. And inside of that is something called the Black Book. And the Black Book contains information about the nuclear triad, the weapons that are available to the president, and what targets he should hit. And they've been predetermined based on different rogue countries that might attack the United States. And then how many people would will die? That's basically the three things the president learns in those seconds before he gives the order of which strike he wants to choose. And so you describe or you call it the black book. Is it, a, is it an actual book? How, how often is this information updated? The black book is so secret. It has never, no president, they're called presidential emergency action directives. No, nothing has ever been leaked. It has never made its way into the public domain. A few individuals have spoken of it. A very few, right? A mill aide once talked about how it was like the, a Denny's menu. That's how he described it. And you choose, you know, I'll have this with that and give me a that on the side, okay? And that's pretty much the only information we have. Los Alamos declassified the origin story of the football for this book for me to share with the public. I'll let readers read about that in the book. But in real time, to answer your question, what does it look like? We don't know. Dr. Glenn McDuff at Los Alamos told me it's called the Black Book because it involves so much death, right? Two of my sources, Ted Postal, the missile expert who used to advise for the Navy, he has seen the Black Book. John Wolfstall, who I interview, who was President Obama's national security advisor on nuclear weapons, he has seen the Black Book. They don't talk about it. There's no reason for them to. You can imagine what is in there. But the nuclear triad is is what we're, what we're getting at here, right? Which is, so America has three weapon systems. We have 400 ICBMs. These are in underground silos. We have 66 bombers that carry multiple nuclear weapons. And then we have 14 what are called Ohio-class nuclear-armed, nuclear-powered submarines. And the president can use all three. So the bombers are the only element of the triad that can be recalled. So they're almost certainly sent out first, but they will take several hours to get where they're going. And by then this will all be over. The, the ICBMs once launched can't be recalled. They are known to be the first weapons to be used because they will involve what is called use them or lose them strategy, meaning because the location of our U.S. ICBMs are public domain, they will be the first targets hit by the Russians. Our submarines, of which there are 14, there are several out at sea at any given time. We never know where they are. Even the people, the only people who know where they are are the people on board. And they're there out at sea for 70 days at a time. And they're just like, zooming around the, the oceans ready to launch. And one particular note to give listeners of like just how close these submarines can get to the United States. And again, this has been debated. Oh my God, they can't get that close. This is hyperbole. For one of the first times ever, the Defense Department recently released a map showing. So, so you cannot find a submarine in real time. They are unlocatable, which makes them what are in are they're generally called the handmaidens of the apocalypse because you can't know where they are and this is simply because they're they're under the surface of the sea and so you can't see them from satellites yeah absolutely satellites can't see them and because they're nuclear powered they can just motor around without ever having to surface right until they come back to port and so but the defense department in its budget requests sort of trying to notify Congress of why it needed so much more money for the nuclear triad, released a sort of after the fact map. You can you can see through these different seabed systems, tracing systems we have called SOSIS, you can see where they have been. 
right? And they show, there's a map, I, I, I reprint a copy of it in the book, and it's just shocking when you realize how close the submarines, both Russia and China, can get to America's coast. And then you're talking about minutes from launch to strike. Is there any way to defend against submarines like that? No. There isn't any any way to deter except for for having submarines with missiles point at uh, the countries that are, yes. And and this is a rabbit hole where you, you sort of, I mean, when we talk about this, it almost seems, how could, you know, you, you almost want to stutter and mutter like, wait, what? It, right? And then you kind of go back to another question. I mean, and I don't mean you, I mean me, I mean anyone who is new to this issue. And then you have to say, well, why do we have all the other weapons if those weapons can end the world? Well, exactly, right? And then we can get into the wonky discussion of deterrence and mutual assured destruction. And believe me, you know, trillions and trillions, untold sums of money, because these numbers are most partially classified, have been spent building weapon systems, unbuilding weapon systems. At one point, we had 60,000 nuclear weapons on the planet, right? Now it's maybe 12,500, you know, it, it's the military industrial complex at its heart. I think we have to remind ourselves that this system of, of nuclear weapons is not rationally designed from a top down uh, by, by a group of people right now. It, it's, it's evolved over time. It has been dependent on, on kind of historical accidents and coincidences and initial trajectories that have then been developed further. And so now we, we're in the situation we, ha we are in now due to um, not entirely um, rational circumstances. You know, I think that is a brilliant assessment. And what a great reminder at this point in this interview to actually bring that up. Because if it, looking from the top down, looking, you know, in arrears, it just seems absolutely apocryphal and, and implausible. And yet... As I take the reader in the book back in, you know, once upon a time after World War II, there was essentially three nuclear weapons. Los Alamos was almost shuttered, right? And as the historians at the lab take me through these numbers of how, you know, then suddenly 1949, Russia had the bomb. Well, wait a minute. Now we have to have more bombs. And then you see the numbers escalate, you know, and and it becomes, like you said, you can see how it's sort of like a series of actions based on what was happening in the world at the time. And the difficulty we face now is exactly as you said so eloquently, that we have arrived here and the world is very, very, very different. And yet the idea that you could just make all the nuclear weapons go away is is just as apocryphal as all of them existing. It is a true conundrum. But the only answer, I believe, is not to play ostrich, like to put your head in the sand and be like, that will never happen. Because, you know, for the first time since the Cold War ended, we have a Russian president who is actually has mentioned the possibility of nuclear use. We have North Korea saying that the Americans are trying to, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially he said the Americans are trying to start nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula. You know, the UN Secretary General recently said in a very significant speech, we are just, and I'm paraphrasing him, but we are one miscalculation, one misunderstanding away from nuclear annihilation. He added, this is madness. It must stop. And that's why I hope people read the book. I think in, in public consciousness, the issue of nuclear war or nuclear attacks has been uh, gotten less attention since the end of the Cold War because people have been living under the threat of nuclear war for, for decades now. And it hasn't happened. So maybe there's the conclusion is, well, maybe this wasn't as big of a deal as, as we, we heard about it in, in it, it being in, in the 60s. But as you mentioned, there's a, there's, a, there's a recent, a lot of worrying developments in the world that point towards uh, nuclear risk being, being higher uh, now than, than perhaps uh, any, at any point in, in the last two decades would be my assessment. And a nuclear war couldn't be farther from a, a war of attrition. It is not a war of attrition. We, the book takes place over 72 minutes, right? 
And when I did an interview with a former STRATCOM commander, General Keeler, and he said to me, yes, Annie, the world could end in a few hours. I was just astonished at that kind of truthful reality coming from someone who would be the point man for the president, right? Because when the president, as we sp spoke of earlier, the, the secretary of defense, he advises the president. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff advises the president. <clears throat> they don't, they're not in the decision-making chain, right? They're, they're advisors. And then they tell the president, essentially, here's what you are required to do. And then the president speaks to the STRATCOM commander through the bunker under the Pentagon, right? There's a chain of command I take people through of like how the actual order comes down. But then the STRATCOM commander, you know, escapes from his bunker. He j runs out to the tarmac. He gets on what's called a doomsday plane. I mean, that is what it is called in the military because it is the command bunker in the sky that will fly around while America is absorbing these nuclear strikes, you know, while tens of millions of people are burning to death in a nuclear holocaust. The Defense Department's STRATCOM commander and his team will be up in the air directing nuclear strikes against enemy nations from the doomsday plane because the comms have been set up that way since the Cold War, you know, using very old school technology to actually communicate with the nuclear triad. We spoke of redundancy earlier. This is what redundancy is. The command bunker at the Pentagon can be obliterated, as it is in the scenario I write, and the doomsday plane can continue to deliver launch codes. What is their mission? What the mission of the doomsday plane is to make sure that the U.S. retaliates. But I, I'm guessing the reasoning for having such such a plane and having that plane have that mission is to make, make sure that no enemy actually launches an attack on the U.S. in the first place. So it seems like we we should the U.S. should communicate the existence of this plane and the existence of submarine capabilities as widely as possible. But I'm, I, how widely is this known? And it 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 all seems a bit insane to me that that you know imagine being in that plane and thinking about your mission as your countrymen are annihilated. I mean, it is, but you raised a really interesting question here, which is when these systems were first put in place in the 50s, the nuclear superpowers, Russia and America, were, you know, I mean, with spies everywhere and just like obsessively learning, sometimes miss, you know, incorrectly so what the other side was doing. And so we have evolved, the two superpowers have evolved with eyeballs on one another. So Almost everything America has, Russia has as well, right? So the mutual assured destruction of it is essentially legit, right? Because so there's no question that Russia command and control doesn't know about the doomsday plane and about, I mean, they know everything. Let's just assume, right? But maybe North Korea doesn't, you know, what is known about North Korea is so thin, it is shocking. You can read an open source Defense Intelligence Agency report. So the DIA is essentially the Pentagon CIA. It's it's internal intelligence source. They have a really interesting several hundred page dossier on what North Korea, you know, is capable of. And like it gives you a real window into what we don't know. And if you read all that and interview DIA people, as I did, and then also interview people in the civilian sector, there's a brilliant analyst named Michael Madden, who is probably the world's expert on Kim Jong-il himself, right? So like, and he understands how that dictatorship works almost better than anyone from like looking at photographs and reading North Korean newspapers and talking to spies, right? And what he, and I write in the book, what he shares with us, what he knows, it is so little, right? Like, we don't know what is known. And that is incredibly dangerous because it leaves a lot of room for supposition mixed with paranoia. And when you have paranoia in the mix, all is lost very quickly. 
When I got to the section of your book talking about interceptor missiles, uh, I was initially pretty hopeful because this seems like a this would be a fantastic solution if we could get something like this up and running. Where the idea is that you would intercept incoming nuclear weapons, destroy them before they they hit mainland uh, U.S. or any other country, and so you you could pour money into developing a pu- purely defensive technology. This isn't an an, an aggression uh, towards uh, China or Russia. This is this is this is more um, or actually purely for defensive purposes. Then we have the the technical issues of why this might not be the perfect solution. Why why isn't this kind of uh, the holy grail of defense against nuclear? I mean, I'm with you that you're you know in layman's terms and sort of poetic terms, you can really imagine exactly what you're talking about with like offense defense the sword and the shield, right? The nuclear missiles are just basically a giant technological sword. And this idea of an interceptor missile, people sometimes think of Israel's Iron Dome, right, is the giant shield. And we see that on television, the rockets coming in from Hamas and the Iron Dome is able to, you know, functions like a big bubble, like a big shield. Well, that is just simply not the case with the interceptor missiles. Starting with the fact that As we spoke of earlier, there are roughly 1,700 ready for launch nuclear weapons on either side, Russia, US. Okay. And when I say ready for launch, meaning most of them are deployed and an ICBM can be launched in 60 seconds. Literally, that's why they call them Minutemen, right? I mean, there's other reasons they're called Minutemen, but that's one of them. Once the subs get the command to launch, it takes them about 14 minutes to get that sub-launched missile launched, okay? So the interceptor, if there's 1,700 of these just ready to go, let's even say 1,000 of them ready to go. Well, there are a grand total of 44 interceptor missiles in the U.S. arsenal. So how's that going to work? Because when in a nuclear launch, you don't launch one unless you're a rogue nation. If you're Russia or, you know, you launch the mother load, you launch all of them because you are trying to take out the other side. And so how is 44 missiles going to take out a thousand? And that doesn't even get into the failure rate of the interceptor missiles. At one point in a 10 year period, let's say 10 years ago, when these new interceptors were being developed, right? And we launch them at Vandenberg Air Force Base and we fly them over the P- Pacific Ocean to Kwajalein Atoll where they're, that's where we get the data of how the launch is going. Well, and w- we try the interception. Something like only nine out of 20 were successfully hit. That's a very low success rate. And Also, I found the technology involved in these interceptor missiles really interesting. And I'm just going to give listeners a quick, a quick idea, right? Because the the interceptor missile launches and then the item that is actually going to allegedly intercept this incoming ICBM warhead. And by the way, at that point, it's no longer a giant 60 foot missile. It's a warhead. Okay. The the nuclear weapon is inside a warhead, which is now in mid-course phase. And inside of that warhead, there are almost certainly multiple decoys to try to, you know, fake out the what is about to kill it. And the, the vehicle that is going to that is on in the nose cone of the interceptor missile is called an exoatmospheric kill vehicle, which is just a fantastic, menacing sounding name, right? But think about it. It's this tiny kinetic it's like a BB gun. It's like, you know, it, it it doesn't have any explosive. It's going to use its own kinetic energy going 20,000 miles an hour up in space to try and hit a warhead that is moving at 15,000 miles an hour. Literally, someone in the Defense Department called it trying to hit a bullet with a bullet. So that's what you're going to trust defense on, the shield defense on. And by the way, I can't even begin to tell you how many billions of dollars American taxpayers have spent. And a recent congressional report revealed that this whole program had problems, air quotes, you know, and so now it's kind of like on strategic pause, whatever that means. Is this purely a matter of cost? So just just hearing these numbers, it sounds like 
<laughs> naively to me at least, it sounds like a, a misprioritization to to have 1,700 uh, nuclear missiles and 55 uh, interceptor. 44. 44, sorry. 44. Could the U.S. have spent uh, a, a much more money on interceptors and, and would that have made the situation better even with the the, the, the quite a bad uh, success rate of these missiles? It's a reasonable question. There is no answer. Meaning, how many billions of dollars do you need to spend on something that might work? I think what is more interesting is that most people, A, most American taxpayers who have funded this, don't even know about this program. And there is also a bizarre assumption that we have such a program that would actually work, right? I mean, I was at a dinner party once, seated next to a very knowledgeable person who will remain nameless, that even worked in government. And I had mentioned him privately, I was working on this book, and he literally said to me, like, that's ridiculous. Our interceptor program would take care of that. I'm paraphrasing him, but essentially that was, and I did not say anything. What do you say to that? That is a knowledgeable, literate person who one would think knows better. But this brings us back to that discussion about people call it the military industrial complex. I think it's more interesting to call it the defense contractor complex, right? And and the, there's insiders who portend to know everything that is going on and have all the details. And then everyone else is kind of like left out in the dark or or spoken down to, right? I always take so much criticism for my books, no, certainly will for this one too, because I try to write for the layman. I try to write for, you know, high school students because they are important and they matter, right? I know I'm read by the generals at the Pentagon, but I like to be read by the little old ladies in South Dakota who also write to me because what we're taught, if you can understand the narrative, then I believe progress can be made by the people, as corny as that sounds. And so that's why I love your metaphor of the interceptor program. Like, wouldn't it be great if this worked? All you need to know is just have a little bit of information to realize, A, it doesn't work, and B, it's probably not the greatest idea to just try and defend against these missiles because more missiles are being built because that is the nature of the defense contractor complex. So really, you have to discuss the problem holistically. Which uh, technologies do you see on the horizon that might upset the status quo here? You write, for example, about the electromagnetic pulse, which might put some warning systems out of use. How would that work? And are there any other technologies like that on the horizon? So the first part of that question is, you know, Russia, Putin in particular, has recently been announcing a whole new class of weapons, the Typhoon submarine that does, that allegedly does all kinds of crazy things and hypersonic missiles. I mean, that's a different, longer conversation because really there's more than enough technology. And by the way, this technology is decades old, but it still works. And, and there's more than enough to destroy the planet and launch us into nuclear winter in 75 minutes you know so that's a whole other discussion about creating new weapon systems because they're certainly not, they're really just meant to be more menacing in my estimation so electromagnetic pulse is one of those subjects that most american defense analysts don't want to talk about because like politics the issue is profoundly divided right there was a time after 911 when a group of you know emp aficionados were warning you know, the defense industry about how dangerous an electromagnetic pulse bomb could be. This is setting in very simple layman's terms. This would mean setting off a nuclear bomb 300 miles up. For example, if you did this over Nebraska, it could essentially take out the entire, you know, grid of the United States, right? You'd have to very specifically explode it 300 miles up in space. And the way in which that would happen was you, it would be carried in a satellite and then detonated. And this group of individuals who were sounding the alarm on this for what was called the EMP Commission were attacked by many of the more sort of liberal, shall we call them pundits, as being, you know, fear mongers and trying to get more money. And right. So it, it and again, this is my this is my estimation of just looking at the history of it. It created a real divide where people were afraid to talk about this, again, in my estimation. 
because one, you know, you would be attacked. You were sort of with the quote unquote fear mongers or you were like some wise PhD. Well, in my research and in my interviewing the world's experts on this matter, that is a really unfortunate division of knowledge because it is not true. Meaning the EMP or what is called a super EMP is an actual legitimate real threat. Can North Korea get a nuclear weapon into a satellite and have it be circling the United States? Well, yes. And I write in the book exactly why. And this is of serious concern. Richard Garwin wrote the first paper on EMP back in 1954. It's still classified. Brigadier General Gregory Tuhill, Obama's first cyber chief, also wrote a classified paper in the 80s or maybe it was the 90s. It's still classified. Both of those people assured me this is of very serious concern. In the book, in sort of the third act, I write about what happens were an EMP, a super EMP to launch. I mean, to explode, to detonate over the United States. And it's it's beyond horrific. I mean, it really, really is. We'll let readers get to that point. But again, I take the readers through some of the debate around this to kind of till the soil to make aware of, of here's another issue that has kind of, in my opinion, purposefully been jettisoned to the sidelines over people worrying about having a position on it. So current uh, nuclear controller command, how vulnerable uh, are these systems to cyber attacks? Uh, I, I spoke with a nuclear expert at some point who told me that the, the only reason why these systems, <laughs> these systems are so old that they are not vulnerable to, to cyber attacks. But we're trying or the US is trying to update the systems in such ways that they might become vulnerable to, to cyber attacks. Is that your uh, read of the situation? You're absolutely correct about all that. Like the systems are incredibly old. It would make sense. You don't want to be able to hack into an ICBM. Is that a conscious decision to make these systems unhackable or uh, harden these systems against cyber attacks? Or is it simply inertia in the system? Well, it has to do with your earlier point that we kind of inherited all of this as it moved along. But somebody was, you know, wise enough to not try and update the system as soon as computer technology became viable, whereas the communication system certainly are updated that way, nuclear command control and communication, NC3. The actual weaponry themselves is, you know, and again, this stuff is like so incredibly classified as it should be, but in a general sense, you are correct. But here's an example of what I found fascinating, and it has to do with the guidance system of the sub-launched ballistic missiles, the SLBMs, right? So if you think about the technology, you've got this giant submarine, it rises to 150 feet below the surface, that's the launch depth. The order is received, the launch keys are turned. This missile, there are 20 missile tubes, there used to be 24, there are 20 missile tubes, right? Each missile has a, each tube has a Trident missile, each missile carries multiple warheads. The trident is jettisoned out of the submarine, rises to the surface of the ocean in one second, and it is there that boost phase begins. So the ignition happens, off it goes. Let's say it's eight or nine minutes to target from someplace in the Pacific Ocean to Pyongyang in North Korea. How does it get there? What is the guidance system? I asked, right? Think about it. It's like, really, if you just stop and think, it's a real jaw-dropping moment. Well, it's star sighting. I mean, there are other technologies as well that are classified, but a star sighting system was created. Literally, there's a little panel in the missile that opens, and it's guiding itself to its target by the stars. And I found this astonishing that, you know, this weapon of Armageddon is relying on one of the oldest human navigation techniques. Wow. Yeah. And that, that it's precise enough to hit its target by 
by navigating using the stars. That's that's pretty amazing. Um, this this whole <laughs> this whole scenario that that you've written about is of course horrific. What have you learned about how we step back from the brink here? What what do we do to introduce safety measures or make this this uh, this whole setup that we have in the world? And here I'm not just talking about the U.S. I'm talking about all of these countries that have we've we've gotten ourselves into this situation. Um, how do we get out of it? Well, there are many fine organizations like yours that work on these disarmament issues, on you know making people aware so that there can be a discussion. For me, as an investigative reporter, as a journalist, as a storyteller, I believe in the power of narrative. I believe if you can get people interested and then secretly get them educated, right? Because they move, they work hand in hand. Then people are comfortable having an opinion, having an, having a voice, right? The best example that I can think of is actually in the domain of television, right? So when I was in high school in the early eighties, there was a television show called the day after, which showed, you know, what would, what a nuclear war would be like and the after effects. And Something like a hundred million Americans watched this, but more important, President Reagan watched it. And when he signed the treaty with Gorbachev and nuclear weapons numbers began to drop from these insane levels to certainly something that are more, you know, we're a lot better off than we were when there were 60,000 nuclear weapons on the planet, right? And that is because of President Reagan and Gorbachev. And the White House called the television producers of the day after and said, just so that you know, you had something to do with this. And I find that remarkable and with a threat has a thread of optimism to it because it means that there can be in people's fear, people's horror can actually be placed in a way that is meaningful how that unfolds, I don't know. You know, I mean, we have seen disarmament over the decades and how it works, but certainly something needs to change because we literally, people are writing articles in major print media left and right saying, we are closer to nuclear Armageddon than we have ever been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that is terrifying. That's such a fantastic piece of history. And, and you're right, it, it, it's... It... It makes me more optimistic about the whole thing. Uh, I do wonder, however, that it's worrying that if if our collective future is dependent on the decisions of very few individuals, such that had had history turned out a bit differently, we we might not be here. Or how important are specific individuals in the history of nuclear risk? Absolutely imperative. And look, you know, it's like Shakespeare said, "Past is prologue," right? So. And one would hope that you have sane individuals. I am not someone who writes about politics. I always write about POTUS, President of the United States. It's an office, and it's a very significant office. I personally don't have public opinions about leaders. I vote. I I do think there is some something to be said in that. It certainly allows me objectivity. And I notice among my friends and colleagues who are on both sides of the aisle, who are very vocal, whatever side they're on, they are just becoming more and more vocal. And I find danger in that because side taking, you know, then we have a horse in the race and then we get stubborn and then we get an ego and then it becomes about right versus wrong. And so I do think people need to look really carefully at at their own position on whether it's wise to be so vociferous about about leaders or whether you should go vote, you know, and vote early. I mean, that sounds very Pollyanna-ish, but at its core, I really believe in that because the leader is so important. And I find that in American politics right now, who would want that job? I mean, it's just a dreadful, you know, you're from the you're on the other side of the pond looking at America. It must just feel it must feel crazy when you see what is going on in the United States of America and how divided 
the country is right now in this moment and how dangerous that is. Do you think we could reduce nuclear risk by having more diffuse responsibilities for launching a counterstrike, for example, or a counterattack? If a council of three had to had to decide, would that make the world safer, or would it simply mean that the the U.S. Uh, command and control wouldn't come to agreement, and then it would be too slow to matter? Sure, these are the threading the needle debates, right? One degree off of that, I would say that almost universally, it is agreed among most wise individuals who are not like super hawks that the launch on warning policy that the United States maintains is reckless and dangerous and should be changed. And almost every president, by the way, in the modern era, certainly in the 21st century, has said that while, you know, running for president. But then they then they take then they become president and Lord knows what they're briefed and that goes out the window. But in other words, you know, even Paul Nitz, who is like one of the the greatest hawks of the Cold War, who was deeply enmeshed in the nuclear buildup and the buildup of the thermonuclear weapon arsenal. He even said later in life that launch on warning is incredibly reckless. People speak of it as, you know, that's the UN secretary, one miscalculation away because, and again, launch on warning means we're not going to wait and see if we have actually been attacked. We are going to launch within that 30 minute window. That is just a, a recipe for disaster. But it will be argued by people on the other side, if you remove that policy, then it will make a, you know, crazy dictator think he can strike the United States. And so then you begin to have that circular debate that people have been having for decades. I think we should end by talking about the last 24 months. So you talk about the first 72 minutes what about the next 24 months? What happens there? Nuclear winter, you know, and what an honor and a privilege it was to interview Professor Brian Toome, who you have interviewed as well. And he, just for listeners who maybe aren't familiar with his work, and they should, certainly should immediately Google his 16-minute TED Talk because it's brilliant. He was one of the original five authors of the nuclear winter theory in 1983, along with the very famous Carl Sagan. And Professor Toon has been working on this issue ever since. And nuclear winter is this idea that after a nuclear exchange, after all these weapons launch back and forth, as I take you through in the book in the 72 minutes, what we haven't touched upon is the nuclear firestorms that happen that in many ways kill more people than the, the explosions themselves, the blast and the radiation. The firestorms, every center point has a firestorm of 100 or 200 square miles. Multiply that by a 1,000. Imagine all that soot going into the atmosphere. This blocks out the sun and becomes what is known as nuclear winter. What I found fascinating in interviewing Professor Toon was that, as he explained to me originally, a big debate, you know, grew of course, the Defense Department said this is, you know, communist propaganda, and many others did. And I'm I'm shocked that this actually continues to, to today, because in 1983, by all the scientists, you know, understanding and discussion, we didn't have the same computer technology and climate modeling systems that we have today. And with the new models, as Tune and others explain, the situation is actually worse than than was initially posited, you know? And when I say worse, you're talking about 70% of the sun going away. You're talking about places like Iowa and Ukraine having sub-zero temperatures. These are the mid-latitudes of the entire earth. Sub-zero temperatures. Agriculture failing and mass starvation as a result um, is, is something that Brian Toon talks about, yeah. And you, when you think about that, it takes your breath away. Right. That, you know, if you were lucky enough to survive the nuclear war. Right. And as Nikita Khrushchev so famously said, the survivors will envy the dead. Right. And this is what will happen in nuclear winter, because it will just be a matter of starvation. 
it gives us a, a, an additional reason to just avoid this whole thing in the first place, as if we didn't have reason enough. But but uh, thinking about you know you can debate the the specific numbers and how how big would the climate effects be of of nuclear attacks and so on. I think it gives us an additional reason, at least to to basically avoid nuclear war um, entirely. Absolutely, and I mean. Tune and others go through these scenarios whereby it isn't a massive exchange between the U.S. and Russia, as I write in my book, but just a, you know, air quotes, small exchange between India and Pakistan, right? Meaning there's no such thing as a small. And they describe, and again, using climate models of today and data from today of what would happen to the entire planet. And this should be read by anyone who is interested in nuclear winter. And this is just a shocking reality that when we think about, you know, I'm going to reference the famous Einstein quote, which is often attributed to him, although I've never been able to actually find the original document. I hope someone will tell me if they can, you know, they that he was allegedly asked, how will World War Three be fought? And he said, paraphrasing, I don't know, but I know that World War Four will be fought with sticks and stones, meaning nuclear winter, nuclear war followed by nuclear winter, will send man back to its hunter-gatherer origins. And that is just a shocking riddle that man evolves to create civilizations, to create technology, to create everything that you and I enjoy today. Not perfect, but wow, you know, only to destroy it all by his own hand. Wow, that's really something to think about. Yeah, let's avoid it. Uh, let's let's avoid it. Uh, thanks for coming on. It's it's been very informative. I've learned a lot. Thanks for talking with me. Thank you so much for having me.